Naysayers might dismiss pro wrestling as fake, but it's not that simple. Sure, outcomes are predetermined and punches are worked, but some of the weapons used when matches go hardcore are as solid as any. Others, not so much. Wrestling fans can often be heard chanting, we want tables, and why not? There is perhaps no more satisfying sight than seeing a dastardly heel get theirs by crashing through a table that explodes on impact, leaving them crumpled in a heap. But beware, the tables seen within wrestling are not where you'd want to eat your Thanksgiving dinner. Real tables are made with thick-set wood to give them their stability and ability to bear weight. Tables in wrestling, meanwhile, are made from an extremely thin chip board. The board can support carefully applied weight, such as someone sprawled across, but with a little force, they're made to snap in half. They're also often gimmicked in that they're pre-cut to make breaking even easier. The table actually serves as a crash pad of sorts, breaking the fall of the wrestlers, both delivering and taking the move. That said, this method has its shortfalls. Sometimes the flimsy nature of the tables means that they can break before the planned spot, or they can fail to support weight. The situation can go in the other direction, too, with the table sometimes refusing to break, despite being gimmicked. They aren't entirely risk-free either, given that the table is usually supported on metal legs. It's not even a game of inches between things going right and something terrible happening. It's a game of centimeters, if not millimeters. The announcer's desk works like the other tables, constructed like flat-pack furniture for performers to go through. Nowadays, they are relatively bare with just a few small, thin screens for the commentators to keep track of the in-ring action. Before a bump, the table is cleared of its covers, screens, and any other objects that can hamper the landing. Once upon a time, the announcer's desk had large monitors built into it. Fans need only re-watch Randy Orton delivering an RKO to Daniel Bryan through the table at WrestleMania 30 to understand how painful a landing on those can be. Kendo sticks, also referred to as Singapore canes, are one of the more iconic weapons in WWE. A wrestler will lash their opponent with the stick, producing a loud crack with each strike as the stick splinters and explodes. But they have been modified to look more painful than they really are. They are usually made from hollow sticks of bamboo taped together at each end to produce that cracking sound, but soften the actual force behind each blow. The tape at each end not only keeps the sticks together, but ensures that when they splinter, the jagged edge doesn't impale anyone. However, they aren't perfect in this regard. Big Show Paul White suffered an eye injury at One Night Stand 2008 from a splintered kendo stick. And even though they're hollow, kendo sticks have dished out plenty of welts. Dominic Mysterio showed the bruising one of these sticks can cause in 2020, after he was the subject of a mauling from Seth Rollins and Buddy Murphy. A trick of the trade wrestlers use to dissipate the pain when taking a kendo stick shot is taking the strike on a larger surface area, like the back or chest. This not only spreads the impact so the pain is less concentrated, but also ensures there is little chance of an adverse shot causing injury. The trash can has become a staple of street fight matches. Wrestlers have made use of them as painful landing spots or blunt force objects against their adversaries, and even a tire of a sort. But it's not hard to notice that the trash cans used in wrestling have a lot of give. They're not like the ones out in the alley. Trash cans in wrestling are usually made from aluminum for malleability and reduced weight. They are effectively no thicker than a soda can, so like most props, they appear more painful than they actually are. A common trash can made of thicker metal wouldn't have the desired crumpling effect when a worker lands on them. Not only do they mitigate the pain for those taking the move, they are far more satisfying for viewers. Their versatility has been tested throughout the years, with Shane McMahon adopting the item into his coast-to-coast -coast maneuver. He props the can atop his opponent in the corner, delivering a drop kick from across the ring. Without the trash can, there is a degree of risk which comes with a flying kick to the face. But with the trash can, there's a cushion in between the bodies, alleviating some of the impact while making an immensely satisfying crashing sound. Outside of WWE, thumbtacks remain one of the most popular weapons in hardcore matches. Their mere introduction often provokes a pop from the crowd, building up to the moment when someone lands on a pile of them. They often remain in the competitor's skin and attire through the end of the match. In WWE, though, they are a rarity. WWE tries to avoid blood, and the thing about thumbtacks is they can't be faked. They're as real as it gets. They did make a surprise appearance during 2016's Ambrose Asylum match between Chris Jericho and Dean Ambrose. Jericho fell back first onto the tacks, and later described taking the bump as more painful in idea than execution. The worst part of that bump was the anticipation of it, thinking about it during the match and what's it going to feel like. Randy Orton also fell onto thumbtacks, delivering a failed RKO to Mick Foley at Backlash 2004. 
Foley said Orton almost immediately regretted it. Foley has also described the feeling of removing tacks as more painful than receiving them. To reduce the risk of injury, wrestlers often land on them on a larger surface area to spread out the impact. By many accounts, taking them to the face and hands is the most painful. Despite being renowned for his hardcore ring work, Foley described taking tacks that way as dumb, conceding that also applies to him. WWE has since made use of Lego bricks instead of tacks, as seen during the NXT Lights Out match between Tiffany Stratton and Wendy Chu. Barbed wire is also a rarity in WWE's modern product, but it saw extended use throughout hardcore legend Mick Foley's WWE tenure, wrapped around Barbie, his signature baseball bat, or a wooden 2x4. Foley made use of the real thing, though it was blunted for safety, as it is often seen used outside of WWE. But he also described how it could be gimmicked in his autobiography. In his infamously brutal clash as Cactus Jack against Triple H at the 2000 Royal Rumble, Foley said that he was using real barbed wire, but Triple H was using faked wire made using rubber tips to craft the barbs because he was uncomfortable taking the legit kind. To give the illusion of barb gashes, Triple H bladed, and the method proved to be effective. Batista and Triple H would go on to use barbed wire in their 2005 Hell in a Cell match. The wire was wrapped around a steel chair from which both men took shots. The wire used was the real blunted wire, and it visually marked up Batista's face. It's by and large up to the performer whether or not they use gimmicked or legitimate barbed wire. But considering WWE has forbidden deliberate bleeding, real wire is unlikely to ever be used again in the company. Barbed wire does see continued use in AEW as in Hangman Adam Page and Swerve Strickland's Texas Deathmatch at Full Gear 2023. Plenty of wrestlers have had musical gimmicks, so it only makes sense that the odd guitar gets smashed over an opponent's head. The instrument was used as a weapon in WWE, most often by Jeff Jarrett, but it was used before him by the likes of the Honky Tonk Man and after by Elias and others. The guitars used in the ring are heavily gimmicked, they're basically completely hollowed out. This makes sure the guitar looks the part on the outside, but with some impact, it just explodes. Jarrett even hit the 76-year-old Fabulous Moolah with one of his guitars, which should speak to the relative safety of the prop. That said, where there is the potential for human error, there will always be injury risk. Jake Roberts can attest to that. He took a shot from the Honky Tonk Man using a real guitar. Roberts said the non-gimmicked item was two and a half inches thick with a fiberglass top, and the shot left him concussed. You have been you were pulling out pieces of that guitar for weeks after this? Is this true? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, fiberglass. Fake glass isn't just a wrestling prop. It's often used for effect in movies, television, and theater. In all those forms of entertainment, as well as wrestling, it's usually sugar glass, which is practically harmless. As its name suggests, it's made by heating dissolved sugar in water until it reaches a hard crack stage. The result is an object that shatters much in the way glass does, without the risk of sharp shards. But sometimes it isn't sugar glass. Infamously, when Shane McMahon and Kurt Angle met at King of the Ring 2001, fear that sugar glass on the stage would have broken or melted led to plexiglass being used instead. So when Angle suplexed McMahon into the pane of glass, it didn't break. McMahon slumped head first to the floor, but insisted on being put through the glass. Despite Angle's reservations, he suplexed McMahon again and the glass broke. As it shattered, both Angle and McMahon were lacerated, McMahon needed 50 stitches in his head, and both spent time in the hospital after the match. The sledgehammer has become a staple weapon in WWE since being popularized by Triple H in 1999. When the game first wielded the tool, it was a prop hammer with a rubber head so that striking his opponent with it didn't cause severe blunt force trauma. But he would also use a real hammer against inanimate objects to sell that he was carrying a legitimate weapon. Best illustrated during a 1999 Raw segment where he smashed a casket with the rock inside. A botch earlier that year involving Triple H and The Undertaker led to WWE making the change to using only real sledgehammers from then on. At WrestleMania 17, the dead man hoisted his rival up for a last ride powerbomb only for Triple H to strike his foe with a sledgehammer to the head. However, the rubber hammer broke and gashed Undertaker's head, busting him open and proving a lasting reminder that even safe props can be dangerous. To ensure that the real hammers used today are safely used, the performers who give the hammer strike place their hand over the head in a driving motion towards their opponent, ensuring they are not actually struck with the hammer. Ladder matches have been around since the 1970s, but didn't start in WWE until the 1990s, the most popular early example being the Intercontinental title match between Razor Ramon and Shawn Michaels. 
They were really popularized in the 2000s with the multi-man tag team championship ladder matches that would evolve into TLC matches also involving tables and chairs. Money in the Bank ladder matches would come later in that decade. In ladder matches, ladders are used both for climbing towards a goal as well as maiming competitors in a variety of ways. Wrestlers have been driven through ladders, snapping them in half under their weight. They've also been used as battering rams to clear the field. That's why they have to be modified for wrestling. A ladder you'd buy at your local hardware store will be sturdy, made with a thick-set metal and capable of taking great weight with very little give. Ladders in wrestling are made with a hollow alloy, providing enough stability to climb while also being light enough to maneuver and collapse under a falling wrestler. They can even serve as a makeshift cushion when wrestlers fall from a height in their matches, but they aren't perfect in their design. There have been many cases when ladders haven't given as wrestlers landed on them. Sometimes someone can bounce off, causing varying degrees of injury. On the flip side, lighter ladders can often be unsuitable to climb after some use. This can be remedied by referees and other workers footing the ladder for the wrestler making the climb, but it often makes the match less believable, leading to complaints from some fans. The steel folding chair is perhaps the most recognized weapon in all of wrestling. Oh no! He's got a steel chair! They are effectively the same chairs often put out for seating in convention halls made of a light, thin alloy with the rivets removed. The rivets are removed so the seat of the chair has more give, which is why they often break after repeated use in a match. Once upon a time in WWE, it was commonplace to see unprotected chair shots to the head. Extensive research into the relationship between concussions and wrestling has led to safeguards, and they're now essentially banned in WWE and in many other promotions. Chairs are now used flat against the back or driven straight into the midsection, and specialized moves such as the concerto will see wrestlers make zero contact with the performer taking the move, clattering one chair against another. Former WWE executive and current AEW commentator Jim Ross has aired his belief that steel chairs should be a thing of the past, citing their outdatedness and stating that the safeguards have rendered them fake-looking. WWE has a penchant for billing its ring steps with a degree of sensationalism. The steps aren't actually 275 pounds of steel like so often touted. They are manufactured from an aluminum alloy to make them sturdy while maneuverable. Aluminum weighs approximately a third of what steel does, which is why wrestlers can lift the steps above their heads and sometimes even use them as projectiles. Those who have caught a glimpse of them while upside down will also know that the sides of the steps are quite thin and thus not so devastating when a wrestler is driven into them for a spot. Furthermore, the give in the metal makes for a softer landing when someone falls onto them. The ring steps received their own central focus in what has thus far been the only steel stairs match in WWE. The bout pitted Eric Rowan against The Big Show at TLC 2014, with the latter picking up the win. The match was received terribly, so there isn't much clamor to bring the stipulation back. But even if they aren't necessarily worthy of a stipulation, they continue to be one of the most used weapons in WWE. Leather straps, chains, and on rare occasions, bull ropes are genuine articles historically used in WWE matches to bond competitors in combat. They serve a dual purpose, making quite the weapon, too. Their use is especially rare in WWE, perhaps because they cannot be gimmicked. Leather straps, for example, leave red raw welts on the skin of those who take hits from them, silencing the crowd with the clap of leather against skin. But they are used occasionally, such as in a match between Drew McIntyre and Karrion Cross in 2022. Chains come in various sizes and applications in WWE. For example, John Cena and Rusev battled in a 2014 Russian chain match for the United States Championship. Cena was joined to Rusev with a chain, and the chain was largely used as a leverage tool. Seth Rollins and Edge also made use of a larger chain in their 2021 Hell in a Cell match, using it to strike each other with super kicks and a stomp. Wrestlers make use of smoke and mirrors to dissipate the risks of using chains and straps. These types of matches in WWE are often considered tame when compared to other promotions, especially AEW and Ring of Honor. For example, Brian Danielson and Ricky Starks fought in a bloodbath at All Out 2023. Mist spit from a wrestler's mouth ranks among the more flamboyant ways to underhandedly defeat an opponent. It has been billed as poisonous, possessing supernatural properties or having a blinding effect. It's actually a harmless concoction of food coloring and water. It's concealed in the mouth with a balloon or a capsule. The great Kabuki is credited as the first to use mist in wrestling, and the idea was thought to have come from Booker Gary Hart. 
Hart wrote in his autobiography that the thought first occurred to him when he watched his wife spill green food coloring on cookies she was baking. He said that he mixed the coloring with mouthwash and poured the concoction into a condom, wrapping it tightly and later practicing the intricacies of its use with kabuki. It has since been used by many Japanese icons in WWE, including Asuka and Tajiri, and continues to be a match-winning move. WWE Hall of Famer The Great Muta became legendary for his own adoption of green mist throughout the years, and House of Black and AEW have their own lore-rich black mist. Theirs is shown to corrupt minds, serving as the catalyst for Julia Hart's heel turn in 2022. In WWE, brass knuckles are mostly associated with William Regal, who scored more wins using a well-placed knuckle duster shot than he ever did with his Regal stretch submission. Real-life brass knuckles are rarely actually made out of brass, but those seen in WWE have often been legitimately metal. Regal and others who have used them threw worked punches to dull their effect. In recent years, their use in WWE has dissipated, given they are legitimately prohibited weapons in some states. But Logan Paul did make use of them during his SummerSlam 2023 match against Ricochet. Regal confirmed in an episode of Table for Three that he would carry a rubber alternative for photo opportunities when he was traveling. That, of course, opens up the possibility for rubber knuckles to be used in wrestling, but that would probably be easily detectable for a TV audience. It did make for a funny story, though. Regal was stopped at an airport for possessing the prop. Light tubes are a staple of hardcore independent wrestling, but they haven't been used in WWE in decades. That's because they are legitimate in all the worst ways, causing severe injury. Light tubes are so often used because they make for an exciting visual, exploding into micro shards of glass in a puff of white smoke when smashed over an opponent. The glass can actually impale on impact and is very dangerous as shards, rendering any surface they litter unsuitable to safely compete. The tubes also often contain mercury, which can enter cuts and get into the bloodstream, causing long-term health issues. Even hardcore legend Mick Foley doesn't like them. I understand that it gets a heck of a pop, but on the risk-reward ratio analysis, it's really low, a lot of risk. He described using them in his 1996 Boiler Room brawl with The Undertaker, saying that they gave Taker a horrible infection, which could have been fatal without the correct medical attention. Foley also noted that indie legend Nick Gage almost died during a death match with Thumbtack Jack at a CZW show. He sliced an artery in his underarm on a broken light tube. Gage somehow survived the ordeal, despite being declared dead for seven minutes. Staple guns can make for uncomfortable viewing in a hardcore match, but they are actually very easy to mask. Part of the reason they can still be used in WWE, despite the ban on deliberate bleeding, is that the gun will fire whether it's loaded with staples or not. Considering most fans are watching from reasonably far away, the sound of the staple gun can be enough to shade the fact that nothing is actually penetrating the skin. It's often the case that no staples are used. Even so, their use in WWE is considerably rare given that staple guns are fairly common tools and kids sometimes imitate what they see on TV, despite warnings not to. Nick Gage has ridiculed the use of a faux staple gun, feeling that the weapon has grown cheesy and declaring he would never do such a thing. Staple guns have been used in AEW, like in Hangman Page and Swerve Strickland's match at Full Gear 2023, where the staples were definitely really in there. The road signs used in wrestling matches are more or less the real thing. They're just not particularly dangerous weapons to begin with. They're usually made of a thin sheet of aluminum, making them easily malleable on impact. As well as an effective visual, road signs are often whacked across a wrestler's back or driven flat into the midsection. The sign wraps around the back, absorbing the kinetic force and making for a loud crashing sound with more style than substance. Road signs have become a staple of WWE's occasional street fight matches. For example, they were just one of many weapons used by Johnny Gargano in his Chicago street fight with Tommaso Ciampa in 2018. Fire simply cannot be faked, but it has still continually been used within WWE over the years. A fairly recent example is when Alexa Bliss blasted Randy Orton with a fireball on Raw in 2021, but its most infamous use is probably when Edge speared Mick Foley through a flaming table at WrestleMania 22. Fireballs in wrestling are usually conjured using flash paper, which magicians also often use. It combusts quickly in a brief flash and gives the effect of a fireball without the risk. The fire itself lasts milliseconds. 
For times when a wrestler has been driven through a flaming table, there are a few considerations to keep in mind. The use of lighter fluid means that the fire burns quickly and can be patted out easily. Wrestlers can also wear a fire retardant. Both Foley and Edge wore retardant gel for their match. Even so, fire is a rarity in today's WWE, but should the need arise, there is always someone waiting at ringside with a fire extinguisher. WWE superstars have made use of fire extinguishers in numerous no-disqualification matches. They can either be used for blunt force, driven into the midsection, or they can be used for their expressed purpose, spraying gas in the face of an adversary. In that case, it's important for the correct type of extinguisher to be used. CO2 is the safest extinguisher to use. It produces a plume of gas which starves a flame of oxygen. Unlike foam extinguishers, there isn't the danger of a chemical burn on the skin. It is still unpleasant to take, described as burning eyes and limiting oxygen intake, but the process is minimally dangerous by comparison. Bruce Prichard recalled a circumstance when the wrong extinguisher was used at WrestleMania 13. On his Something to Wrestle With podcast, Prichard described how road warrior Hawk used a powder extinguisher, producing a plume of chemicals that filled the arena. He grabbed the, the goddamn one with the chemicals in it, the powder chemicals in it that just is impossible to breathe. It was a mistake that could have cost lives given the damage that breathing in such chemicals can do. Luckily, ringside staff got the extinguisher away before Hawk further used it. The use of baseball bats in wrestling is commonplace now, with former WWE stars Sting and Chris Jericho making them a mainstay in AEW. But they have also seen use within WWE. Sting, for one, made use of the signature black baseball bat in his 2014-2015 run with the company. The bats used in wrestling are real wooden or aluminum baseball bats. Once again, it's the way they're used that keeps wrestlers safe. The bat is almost never swung uncontrollably unless there is no active intent to strike an opponent. Rather, it's held straight and driven into opponents with the striker's hand covering the end. To this effect, Triple H and Sting's WrestleMania 31 match featured the pair using their signature sledgehammer and baseball bat with the same motions. In regions where cricket is the prevailing sport, cricket bats are sometimes used. Those are traditionally crafted from willow, although some are made with birch as a softer wood with a flat front used for striking the ball. These bats allow for a different motion, the flat face perfect to be struck across a large surface area like the back.